Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, home stretch at the Roundhouse, a record $9.6 billion state budget headed to the governor's desk after some last minute negotiations. Everybody comes here with a priority. We all live in different districts. We all think differently on what we think needs to be appropriated. And alcohol tax increase approved. The Senate is upping a proposed tax on booze, but we'll explain why it's so much lower than originally planned. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. The 2023 60-day legislative session is set to end Saturday, and lawmakers are putting finishing touches on several key pieces of legislation. We are recording this episode less than 48 hours before the state legislature adjourns at noon on March 18th, so keep in mind there could be action between the time we've taped this and the time you're seeing it. Now, one thing that won't change is a bill ensuring access to reproduction and gender-affirming care will head to the governor's desk. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham is expected to sign House Bill 7, but some anti-abortion advocates are promising legal action. In about 25 minutes, I'll ask our line opinion panelists if those threats should be taken seriously. But first, a record-setting state budget that passed out of the legislature Wednesday night is catching some eyes around the state. Let's get to the line. Now it's time to welcome our line opinion panelists for the week. We're happy to be joined by, in studio by the way, former state representative Daniel Foley. Right to his left, our regular attorney Sophie Martin is with us and CEO of Girl Scouts of America and former New Mexico Cabinet Secretary Rebecca Latham right across the table there. Thank you all for being here. Now, unsustainable, that's the word used by Senator George Munoz, the state Senate Finance Committee Chair, talking to the Santa Fe New Mexican about a proposed $9.6 billion spending bill. The state Senate approved it Sunday with a more than $1 billion increase in spending. The House passage Wednesday night means a 30% increase in recurring expenses is headed to the governor's desk, Daniel. Big money here. You know, you sat through budget negotiations during your time in the House, no doubt about that. Would you have been one of those people saying, hey, guys, we need to stop here. Something's not quite going See, on track here. you me since I was in the legislature. Where Absolutely. do you think I would have been? I know where you would have been. So, I want to hear you say so, it. Though. Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think it's insane. I think, mm -hmm. you know, this, this, I don't want to take all the time, but here's one do of the, 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 the <clears throat> problems we have. When Gary Johnson was governor, not discussing his time, mm -hmm. there was a big fight where he tried to cut back some programs, I recall it well. and he got sued. And it went to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court said, once you create an entitlement program, you can stop the entitlement program, but you're responsible for everybody that joined when it was on. You I can't see. kick them off. And so one of the biggest concerns I always have is I'm like, well, how many of these programs are you starting that are entitlement programs? Right. Because if you do this and you grow them and five years from now we don't have the money, you can't go back to today and say we're going to kick all these people off that were on there. You have to now figure out how to absorb that growth over the three, four, five years of the programs that you've put on there. And I just, I feel like at the end of the day, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of gumption by anybody in the legislature. It's not just a party issue. I mean, there's Republicans up there that can't spend enough money. And uh, sure. at the end of the day, you know, I, I'll, I'll finish by telling Please. you kind of a, a funny side note. I wrote an op-ed years ago mm -hmm. about this, and I said, you know, we should be embarrassed. I said, we're spending money like drunken sailors. And I got a letter from a guy who said, my name is Joe. I just want you to know I'm a drunken sailor, and I'm insulted <laughs> by your comments. And he skipped a few lines, and he said, because when I'm drunk, I spend my money. I don't spend yeah. your money. So don't besmirch the Fair name point. of drunken sailors by saying that they, those right. people are like us. <laughs> so, you know, at some point, I would say this, I will say this, you know, I appreciate Senator Munoz and others coming up and saying things, right. but it's one thing to say something, you have the ability to fix it. Right. Uh, you have the right. ability to say enough's enough. And so, sure you know, we're in a position now, I think, I think when I was in the legislature, mm -hmm. we got to a billion dollars for the first time in the budget. Mm -hmm. um, and because I was, I was in in the 90s, I'm old. Uh, I think we got to a billion dollars the first oh, time. Oh, that's back when my rent was like 300 There you go. <laughs> we, we got to three, wow. we got to a billion dollars. And I thought we were all like, oh my gosh. And now we're talking almost 10 right. billion right. dollars for a budget. I mean, just, just put that in, in perspective. There's, what, uh, 1.3 million people in the state of New Mexico? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money. And then, and then, then on top of that, we're, we're, we're at the bottom of a lot of good polls. We're at the top of a lot of bad polls. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you've got to say to yourself, what are we doing? Like, where's our educational system? Where's right. our road infrastructure? Right. What are we doing for the crime and drug epidemic in the state that's going on? How are we fixing these problems? The answer seems to be, well, we're going to tax more. We're going to come up with another tax. And it's, it's right. kind of 
troublesome. Yeah. I, you know, I just want to say, though, I think uh, n nobody should be surprised, and I probably will get the drunken sailor emails now, <laughs> um, but uh, not that I'm going to call anybody that. But, you know, here's what we know about the two parties, right? Mm -hmm. You have one party that's profoundly interested in cutting taxes and cutting spending, and another party that's profoundly interested in providing services, which do cost money. And both parties, that's each party... That's a really nice way of putting it. Each party, <laughs> when they're in... <laughs> it's not the only thing they're interested in. We'll talk about some of those other things later today. But, but each party, when they are in power within uh, state government, federal government, etc., looks to lock in what they can lock in right. that meets their goals and their, their perspective on governance. And so do Republicans attempt to make tax, uh, tax cuts permanent or so unpalatable to change that no one would dream of touching it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do Democrats attempt to put programs in place that will it'll be too unpopular or, or legally difficult to to remove them absolutely that's part of the push and pull of governance i think though you know in in this particular case there has also been a lot of angst over like um oh this happened behind closed doors etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know what each party does that when right. they're in power exactly right. and when you get down i really believe when you get down to I don't like the way the sausage was made. You've lost the war on what is actually, in this case, in the budget package. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that's all you have left, that money's going through, it's going to be spent. That's an interesting point there. I want to circle back to something specifically on that point, Sophie, but I want to get Rebecca in on this point. According to Source New Mexico, I mean, a lot of agencies are reading, receiving hundreds of millions of dollars beyond even their own ask. I mean, we're talking about uh, Medicaid, the state's natural resources agencies, public ed, we're going to talk about that, higher ed, early childhood education, four million more has been set aside for tourism, two million more for economic development. I'm not using a tone here like it's wrong. Uh, my tone is about, wait a minute, is anyone really watching how we're doling out this kind of money? What I'm asking Rebecca, in your f former position, you've got a bit of a different feel here in your gut. Uh, do you like how you're seeing this? come around? Well, I don't think anybody mm -hmm. likes the idea of shenanigans, right. backroom deals. Right. I think someone called it poppycock. Right. But also, this is not new. The right. Senate Finance Committee right. does this every single year. So it's interesting to read Senator Munoz mm -hmm. saying this is the last year we're doing this. Mm -hmm. I, it's like, I don't know why the, why the attention given to it now, but I distinctly remember mm -hmm. going through the Senate Finance Committee lobbying for the priorities that the executive uh, outlined mm -hmm. and and you know there being some push and pull there but also knowing it ain't over yet mm -hmm. right. there's still going to be some things that are added in and the That's senate right. finance committee is known for adding things right. in right. you know at the last minute i think the only thing that, that that made it more noticeable this time is that they uh, they passed it before they put their stuff in right and then they brought it back and right. said we're gonna put more stuff in and then pass it and so that, I, that it's just they just did the same thing that they always do they just got caught because right. they had a misstep that's right but um you know i think the other thing to, to, to keep in mind and mm -hmm. i don't know i have not read uh House Bill 2 now. I don't know how each of the requests stand. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that when you're giving agencies more money than they're asking for, those are pet projects. Right. That's, I, I mean, and whether they came in at the beginning right. or they came in at the end, right. those are exactly like, you know, those are pass-throughs. And right. if there's a process for having your, pro your project funded, then follow the process. Mm -hmm. Don't don't lobby for your own project. Have it be turned down and then squeeze something in at the back. It just it doesn't feel good. Yeah. And and the unsustainable part really as a wife of a state employee. Right. The unsustain the un sustainability of a budget. Right. Really concerns you me. You consider the last two two years, just the increases in only two years, just phenomenal. But guys, we have this. We have a release from the governor's office from Michelle Lujan Grisham, headline, Governor Urges Fiscal Responsibility on Tax Package. Now, this is as we tape this Thursday midday, and we're barreling towards Saturday uh, midday, Sophie, where this tax package, uh, the governor's quote from this release, put simply, this tax package cuts too deep too quickly. Um, she's not crazy about how this is coming down. What are well, we headed I mean, towards you're, here? We're going to have this push and pull, and I mean, we see this on the federal level as yeah. as well. Like, okay, we didn't get what we want in our budget, but we can starve the beast, right? Let's use the this is George Lakoff mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, term, and so you know, the the battle over over budget doesn't end 
when the budget, budget package is put together, there's right. also how, how are we going to fund this? And it's you can probably characterize it better yeah, than no, I can, it, but it, it, I mean, the battle's deal. not done. It's, mm -hmm. it's a fair deal. I, I would also say that part of the problem is, is, and this is what happens with the second term of a governor, right? Mm. Now legislators start saying, listen, I got to run three more times. You don't have to run at all. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you're going to start doing this stuff. I get it what you want to do, but it's not what I want to do. And guess what? You don't ever have to stand up before the voters again, mm -hmm. and I do in 12 months. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to go out and start raising money today, and this is the kind of stuff that's going to make somebody go out and be able to do the things they need to do to get reelected. You know, mm -hmm. the worst place to be in Santa Fe is between a legislator and a camera. I mean, that's the most dangerous <laughs> position. <laughs> I think I saw a yes. tweet from Darren White recently that said campaigns are a terrible drug or a dangerous oh, drug yeah. Yeah. Uh, because they do lead you to make really poor He's decisions. He's an expert. Right. Right. We've, got some, we've got some interesting quotes here from some senators saying, you know, we need to slow down here. This is madness. Let me throw one more on the table here, just a little bit short on time. Hold on, Jay, I was going to say, before Please. you go on, you know what's interesting, though, is all this talk, just I'm thinking back, mm -hmm. about Senate finance and all these quotes from senators. You know, when I was in the legislature, it wasn't the Senate that had anything to do with finance. It was, it was Max Call and House Appropriations, right. Right. and then once things changed and Manny took over, the, the, the revolt, the role switched. It used to be back when I was in the legislature, these conversations would be about what the speaker was saying, what mm -hmm. Max Call was saying, mm -hmm. what House Appropriations was saying, and they seem to have abdicated that authority to the Senate now. That's actually an interesting point there. You're right. Something seems to have switched. Now, let me, uh, tax rebates. Sophie, let me start with you. I mean, we're back to 500 for single people, 1,000 for couples. The governor wanted more. The legislator wanted less at some point. Do these things mean anything at the end of the day after all we're talking I, about? I, th I think for individuals and, and for couples, since yeah. we, you know, since you brought that up, I mm -hmm. think it does make a difference. Okay. Um, and in a state as poor as New Mexico, um, any any sort of cash infusion, I would expect that the majority of New Mexicans will spend that money quickly. Right. It makes great right. makes great mailers at election time. That's yeah, right. you know, that's, that's true. That's right. Like as a that's mom, right. I used to be able to budget one hundred and fifty dollars a week to go get my groceries. Now we're spending three hundred dollars mm. a week for my yeah. family of four. A one-time tax rebate does nothing for me. A, a, a tax reform that is monumental change right. for New Mexico families. Right. Don't just throw a couple bucks my way. Like I need help at the grocery store long term. And the mm -hmm. gas pumps and all the other. Right. I mean, All here's that. the here's the thing that Gina. I know we're running short of time. Mm -hmm. We're talking about we have a press release that's talking about tax cuts are too deep. Mm -hmm. Yet we have the largest surplus of money the state's ever had. I mean, at some point, people are going to catch on and say, "How can you say mm -hmm. it's not worth giving money back or cutting taxes for the, the citizens in the state of New Mexico or doing more to attract individuals or businesses when you have the most money in reserves, the most money coming in? You had the, the profit year, Isn't record the year." The Republican Party, the one, the part, group that said we can't spend on things like early childhood education because we've got to save for the rainy day. We still have the potential of rainy day, and I feel like the Republican Party has done a good job of pointing out that could be coming. Right. Um, you can't really have it. I guess we all try to have it I'm both not, ways. I'm not, yeah, but, I'm not saying but, that we should save this. First, I'd say two things. First of all, is I think there should be opportunities to get this money back in the hands of the people that are earning it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I would say, you know, I'll be the lone guy speaking out against childhood education, early childhood education. We are now 50th in the 51st in the country in educating kids. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great idea to get a program that puts kids in our education system earlier because we're so bad at educating them as it is. The sooner we get started, the better off we'll be mm -hmm. in the end. Thanks mm -hmm. to our line opinion panel on that one. We'll be right back here at the table in about 10 minutes to talk about the threat of legal action over the proposed abortion rights bill. We're going to talk about that one. But first, we head inside the Roundhouse with New Mexico In Focus political correspondent Gwyneth Doland. It's the last week of the legislative session, which this year coincides with Sunshine Week. That's a national celebration of access to information, information we as reporters need to do our jobs. I'm here with Dan Boyd of the Albuquerque Journal. Dan, you've been reporting on the budget. Um, there have been complaints about transparency as the budget has moved through and with the omnibus tax package. Are these complaints new? No, they're, they're not new. This is something we, we deal with on a yearly basis. There have been attempts to kind of improve transparency, but a lot of times we're still struggling to try to get up-to-date information about the budget numbers, what it really means for New Mexicans, and then obviously to try to present that information to readers and do that on a, a daily basis. So it can be a struggle to try to find out what these changes are and, and then, you know, be able to digest them and convey that information. Now we're used to this because it is always a struggle, but uh, could it be better? I, I think it could. I mean, I, th I think now, especially with 
so many things being digital, you know, if the information could be presented to people. I think people are interested in, you know, the rebates that they might be getting this year about their tax rates, about spending on different programs and schools, things like that. Certainly that the format of the session makes it difficult when, when you're facing a time crunch, but I think more of an emphasis could be placed on trying to get this information out there before these votes you know, take place. Uh, we struggled for years. Open government advocates, journalists struggled for years to get more information about capital outlay, money that goes to infrastructure projects. Each lawmaker gets their own little pot. It used to be secret, now it's public. Now there is a push to get extra information about the junior bill. What's the junior bill and why would that information be helpful? So the junior bill is also a spending bill. It's, it's kind of uh, similar to capital outlay, but it's more for state agencies and programs and things like that. Uh, so what they're talking about is, is kind of like capital outlay. It, it would be a baby step toward transparency, but at least requiring after the session ends to disclose which legislator funded which project. So at least then the public can see that and, you know, a little more accountability for how that money is spent. Overall, since you've been reporting on the legislature, has transparency improved? I, I think it has improved. I think there's been some effort, certainly with the webcasting, we've seen some, some pretty good leaps in that. I think with the budget process, it's hard to break that culture of a lot of this happening behind closed doors. So there's been tiny little steps, but I think there's still a lot of room for improvement. Rob Black, thank you for being with us today. You represent a thousand businesses all over the state, maybe 50% of the workforce in New Mexico. How is transparency important to businesses in New Mexico, businesses large and small? Understanding how decisions get made and what, what makes up those decisions is really important for how, we, how businesses determine where they're going to invest, who they need to hire to do the work. So having a good understanding of, of where decisions are being made and how is really important for the business community to be able to grow and, and thrive in the state. Over the years, uh, chambers of commerce in New Mexico have advocated for more open government, and we have seen changes. We've seen an increase in webcasting, more information on the website. We've now got information about capital outlay, uh, and they're pushing for in more information about the budget and supplemental funding. What more transparency would the business community like to see up here? Well, I think one of the things, and we are supportive of this, is getting more staff for the legislature. Because frankly, whenever you're doing committees, committee, new committees and agendas, they're running late. You may not have any idea what is on the agenda that may be heard that's really relevant to your business until it's too late to even show up or sign up to do public comment or, or make a comment. So I think there has to be more proactive efforts to get that information out early for, for the public to engage. I do salute the legislature for doing the hybrid work. That allows for our members who may be in, in, in grants or in Las Cruces to engage with the legislature without all the way, you know, driving all the way up here or just relying on us to be their voice and, and they can be their voice directly. So I think those technology pieces are really important, but we do need to invest in staff so they can get, be more proactive in getting that information out effectively to the public. Senator Munoz, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. So you are the chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Part of your job is wrangling the budget. This is the biggest state budget we've ever had, but there have been complaints about backdoor deals, uh, some machinations, finagling uh, with the budget at the last minute. Has this process been transparent? This is the most transparent budget we've ever seen. We've never done Senate amendments in language, Senate amendments in open and public before. And so people complain, but there's the people complain that aren't getting what they want. And do they really need it? With $4 million in capital, $900,000 in junior money, how, uh, transparency is so clear. I mean, the junior bill with the amendment with everybody's name on what they appropriated, the capital bill with everybody's name on what they appropriated, and with Senate finance doing everything in the open. A few years ago, uh, the legislature decided to make public the information about capital outlay, who's funding which infrastructure projects and for how much. Um, and so now there is this push to do this with the junior bill. Should we even have this bill that just hands out money for special projects? Well, the junior bill was intended to really help agencies with budget requests. That was the junior bill to offset Senate amendments. And now the junior bill is completely turned different 
And so I don't think there'll be a junior bill again. But the intention was, instead of doing Senate amendments, you're going to do it through junior with legislators saying, I like, I love the environment department. Oh, I love economic development. Oh, I love tourism. And that's the money where it should have went. But the junior bill has turned topsy-turvy. And, and with their name on it, you'll be able to see clearly where they're appropriating money. Um, so um, I'm hearing you criticize the way the junior bill has said now, and this is the same criticism that we used to hear about capital outlay. How could this work in a more perfect universe? Well, we amended the junior bill so legislators, everybody knows whose legislators are sponsoring what. That's clarity, right? But could there be a process where people plan this stuff maybe more ahead of time or it goes into the budget to begin with? Well, it's, it's hard to manage that because until we know what our budget looks like and when we didn't have money before, it was a bigger fight. And so everybody comes here with a priority. We all live in different districts. We all think differently on what we think needs to be appropriated. And so when we try to do the junior bill, that's what our thought process was. Help the agencies, CYFD, whoever it may be, whichever agency, to get the full funding that they need. And, and then you have say in the budget process. Can you give me an example of some more of the kinds of things that happen because of the money in the junior bill? Well, I can tell you where I appropriated my money, right? <clears throat> my money went to the judicial courts. It went to buy uh, police vehicles. It went to domestic violence, where the greatest needs were. And so I know that in, in my district for the courts, they needed money for security, and that's where I put my money. There were complaints that the governor uh, kind of pushed the budget around, pushed the tax package around a little bit. Um, is this normal? Is this the way that business is done? Uh, should that be more public? Well, I don't think the governor pushed, right? We come up here and we try to come to a consensus. We know, and I know, that I like opportunity scholarship. I think that giving every kid a chance to go to school is, is a good thing to do. Any education we can get a kid is a good thing. So we rearranged the way the House sent it over. They sent it over short. And so we rearranged what happened and put it in recurring dollars. I think that's an agreement, not really a backdoor push. I think that's just something we can agree on. Rural health care. There's another thing that the exec really wanted. And, and I think is good for all of New Mexico. Well, it came over short. So what do we do? we got to rearrange the deck chairs and put the money where, where it goes to work with a Medicaid match. And we get to the dollar amount with less money and the governor's in agreement. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want people to know about how things have worked out this session or the budget or transparency? Well, you know, the media has eaten up this, oh, it's not, it's behind the door deals and it's, it's really not. I mean, the old days you used to go over to LFC they sit you in a room and, and you go through language and you go through money. And that's ended. And since I've been the chair of Senate Finance, there's been more openness about the budget process than there ever was before. And the problem with the bar budget process is last minute deals that go behind the bill that absolutely, sometimes they absolutely have to happen. I will give you a, a perfect example. Um, Homeland Security was short on federal funding to get federal matches. And so that's a priority for us to do at the last minute and put that money through because we have another natural disaster. They're, they'll have the ability to go grab that money and, and match it with federal money and do what they need to do. So there is some stuff that has to be done, although they don't see the agencies come in and they don't present every time they need 300,000 or 200,000. Uh, and as we make up the shortage in, in the agencies, um, some of that process you just kind of do on your own, say it's the right thing to do. I'm, I was elected and, and I was chosen by the Senate to lead the Senate Finance Committee and to make those, those decisions that matter to agencies that are important to things, uh, people or agencies when things happen. These hearings have been full of the voices of both supporters and opponents. Um, my uh, my colleagues at New Mexico In Depth have done some great reporting to show, though, that one of the forces behind the scenes here isn't just the comments that are being made, but the people who are making it, because the alcohol industry is hired among the top lobbyists in Santa Fe for uh, to, to represent their interests there. And we uh, we did the math on the political contributions, and the alcohol industry has given about three quarters of a million dollars to New Mexican legislatures in the last 10 years. 
Our second topic on the line concerns access to health care. As lawmakers in New Mexico prepare to pass legislation protecting the public's access to reproductive and gender affirming care, an anti-abortion activist from Texas has caught the attention of international media. That will be Pastor Mark Lee Dixon of, quote, Right to Life of East Texas, end quote, that's the company, was the subject of a feature article by The Guardian last week. The story highlighted Dixon's work pushing anti-abortion ordinances in cities across the U.S., and that includes several New Mexico municipalities, including Lee and Roosevelt counties, Hobbs, Clovis, and Eunice. It's a lot of places. These ordinances in New Mexico follow the Comstock Act. Sophie's going to talk about that. A federal law that dates back to 1873. And if you don't know about this, under the Comstock Act, mailing, importating, or transporting obscene or crime-inciting materials is illegal. That includes any drug, medicine, article, or thing designed, adapted, or intended for producing abortion. That's the point here, Sophie, isn't it? Mr. Dixon spoke to The Guardian about New Mexico's proposed House Bill 7, which would override anti-abortion ordinances enacted by municipalities in the last year. What do you think about that? Well, That's there, amazing. There's a lot going on. And, and I is. would just start by saying, mm -hmm. um, and, I think, and I think people recognize this while it was happening, that the U.S. Supreme Court really opened the floodgates um, in its Dobbs ruling overturning mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we're seeing now is what is what, um, you know, the judiciary or the Congress, et cetera, would consider sort of the, the experimentation that happens in the states trying to figure out mm -hmm. where the, you know, the crucible of, I've forgotten what it is, experiments or something, mm -hmm. um, but trying to figure out what, how far on one side, how far we can push here, how far we can push there. And this occurs, of course, in the context of a highly conservative U.S. Supreme Court. And at, at one time right. we would have said conservative meant um, hewing to precedent, sticking with uh, what we call stare decisis, which is, you know, this, this basically has already been decided, we can build on it, but we're not gonna tear it away. Mm -hmm. This U.S. Supreme Court would argue that they're not changing things, they're clarifying them. And so within that context, something like the Comstock Act, I mean, 1873, right. and which was largely designed to prevent by this Comstock guy who was in charge of the mails back then, prevent the mailing of smut he was concerned about whatever the 1873 <laughs> version of Playboy was. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this other stuff came into. Mm -hmm. uh, over the years, and really as, as long ago as the early 20th century, the, the countries, the, the judiciary's understanding, of Congress's understanding of, of this law has changed. And mm -hmm. so there is this both legislative and judicial record that has really torn away a lot of the elements of the Comstock Act to, such that today the Department of Justice would say, look, mailing um, medical abortion drugs is, is not going to be a problem under the Comstock Act. I what see. you don't know, I realize mm -hmm. I'm like such a lecture now, but what you don't know is mm -hmm. what this Supreme Court will decide to do. Will they right. say, nah, you know what, we like the Comstock Act. No, sure. <laughs> I don't think anybody is getting Playboy through the mail anymore anyway, but right, right. no more Playboy through the mail, <laughs> no more drugs through the mail. And that's what initiatives like this are trying to, to do. They're trying mm -hmm. to get up to that U.S. Supreme Court. Interesting point there. Um, I, I'm wondering, I gotta ask one more question, Sophie. Are, is it better strategy for local people to wait for that circumstance before they start in on this? Meaning the Supreme Court comes out with a ruling and then locals start to think well, about current, this or the I other mean, way the, around? The current mm -hmm. ruling is essentially this is a state's issue. Okay. And New Mexico has been you know, a real leader amongst the states that seek to pr protect abortion rights, right. medical care uh, no, for transition no. for transgender individuals. Mm -hmm. um, that We've been a leader in that. Um, even just in the past week or so, mm -hmm. we've seen legislation come through protecting um, doctors, protecting patients, protecting rights. And so it remains to be seen now, mm -hmm. will the court stick with its states' rights approach, mm -hmm. or will somehow they find a way to say, but not not those rules, not in That's New important to get in. It is sort of an overriding national issue, Rebecca, but it's also local. It's just that one of those weird spongy issues that were in process. And I got to ask you, I mean, these folks uh, that are against this, they've already been quoted as saying, if New Mexico tries to overturn these ordinances, anti-abortion advocates will take the fight to the court. So we know what's going to be happening here. And then also, these sanctuary cities for the unborn. 
That's an interesting little thing we've got going on here. How did New Mexico end up targeted here out of all of these uh, uh, states that are out there? It's amazing. Uh, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't think I have an answer for yeah. that about how New Mexico found ourselves in this position, other than the fact that we are just, I think, from around the country. You know, we are mm -hmm. um, s perceived to be so um, pro. Mm -hmm. I, I hate calling them, uh, I guess, pro-reproductive health care mm -hmm. uh, because, um, you know, we're sandwiched in between some really conservative states. Right. Um, I, when I was looking into this, you know, I just found myself with more questions mm -hmm. that I had about the whole thing about, I think there were some quotes from members of the legislature regarding the, na the whole idea that this is a national divorce, it's called a national mm. divorce. Like Texas has been trying to divorce the U.S. for how many years? And <laughs> yes. they're still here <clears throat> since the beginning. Um, I think there, you know, there's just quotes about, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, I, uh, it, the whole thing, I think, just is, this is not a moral issue. Yeah. Women need to have rights to, to, to health care. Right. Um, I, I hate that, it, that, that it's always about abortion. It's not always about abortion. Mm -hmm. It's not, again, it's not, a, it's, there's just, it's so much. And I think it's, right. it's difficult for women even to like, to, to, to articulate. Sure. Um, but just bottom line, like women need to be able to mm -hmm. have access to health care mm -hmm. with their reproductive That's organs, right. full right. stop. Yep. Um, enforcement, Dan, you know, for the, for the counties that have enacted these ordinances and we've come up with this new state law, we've seen this come down before. Certain counties are just not going to follow, you know, they want to follow their own deal. That's why they passed it in these yeah, areas. I, I, so. I, I, well, Jane, I think the bigger question is, is, mm -hmm. is the hypocrisy, right? You know, we went through this with sanctuary cities, right? We had sanctuary cities, we had cities that said, hey, listen, mm -hmm. we're not going to enforce federal immigration law. Mm -hmm. We're not going to enforce state, state law. We're not going to enforce, we're going to change the law locally. We're going to welcome, uh, we're going to become a sanctuary city. Mm -hmm. Now, it's okay to do that, mm -hmm. but it's not okay to do this. So it's just the idea of the hypocrisy that's, it's rampant on both sides, obviously. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no doubt about it, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, just this issue alone, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, I, and you know, I've, I've been doing the show for a long time, long time with Sophie and I really appreciate, and Sophie and I don't agree on a lot of things and we're not gonna agree on this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I think it's interesting when Sophie says, hey, listen, the Supreme Court is conservative and, and yeah, I think they are kind of conservative, but instead of saying, is it a bunch of conservative judges that are trying to do something, maybe it's a pushback mm -hmm. to a swing from the, by the left that people are saying enough's enough, right? Mm -hmm. You had Roe v. Wade, which was, you know, if we, if we look back, was about a, a woman who, who, was, who claimed to not know the father of the child, wanted a first term sure. abortion. Today we're talking about late term abortions at a point that it's okay for dinner topics now. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, when you, look at, when you look at the polls that are going out there, the number of people that are in favor of women's choice, women's reproductive rights, unbelievably high. Mm -hmm. When you start going into late term abortion, those numbers change drastically. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe instead of us just saying it's, it's the court's problem, mm -hmm. maybe some of these entities that, that are out there pushing these agendas have created this own backlash by right. saying, you know, we want to label it really nice and pretty and put it in a box like this, but we really have this agenda. Right. And I think that people are saying, listen, you know, if you're going to, and, and one of the things I think that's, that's interesting to watch is a lot of conservative organizations, conservative groups have really learned from the left about mm -hmm. utilizing the courts, right? Mm -hmm. For years, the, the left True. did a phenomenal job of yeah. letting things happen and then going to the courts to get the courts to impose what they wanted done, right. and they were able to do it, and we've seen the effect of that. And I think it's maybe a little too late to the party, but I think conservative organizations are showing up and saying, hey, listen, two could play at this game. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and pass what you want to pass. You got the votes, but we'll go ahead and get in front of one person, run the risk of you know looking at, at pulling, and I'll, I'll defer to Sophie, hey, we got five judges that we can get, that can get this case. We like our chances with three mm -hmm. of the five, so we're going to go ahead and let you do what you want to do over here, but we're going to get in front of that judge. That's right. You did, That's right. just made a good, if, if we still have Please. time, I, yeah. I did want to bring up mm -hmm. uh, Federal Judge Matthew Kazmarek out of Texas um, has just heard arguments on a case that I, I, it seems likely could affect the entire country regarding mm -hmm. uh, medical abortion, so, so the use of abortion drugs. And um, it's a, it, the, the assumption at this point, looking at his track record, is mm -hmm. that he will attempt that he'll put a ruling in place that will block the sale of, uh -huh. of these drugs uh -huh. um, and will attempt to do it in such a way that, that affects the entire country. I mean, I'm just very, sure. very lightly sort of touching on that, but I think we're going to expect to see in the very near future a ruling where there will be an impact in New Mexico. I mean, you know, uh, 
this medication-based abortion is, is now the most common form of abortion in mm -hmm. the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, it is by, sort of by definition early term. It is not late term, so it does right. not get into at all the, the issues that, um, mm -hmm. that Dan was bringing up. Can I ask you one more thing? And I'm going to ask her one more minute out of the booth here. I think it's kind of important for Sophie. I want to ask you, House Bill 7 would allow state a, uh, attorney general or a district attorney, which is in interesting to me, mm -hmm. the right to initiate a civil lawsuit in district court if they feel a governmental body has acted to deny or prevent a legal right to obtain reproductive health care services. It's a $5,000 ding, I guess, for mm -hmm. the governing body if they found guilty. Plus legal costs. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, uh, always. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just, in your opinion, how loath or anxious might an AG or for a, uh, a district attorney to well, be I mean, it's to file charges It's 100 percent about, you know, their perspective on the law, right. perhaps their personal approach to the law of personal beliefs, and then, as came up earlier, you know, what are their, what are their constituents? What does right. their community right. expect of them? That's right. And so, I mean, I would expect there to see, for the most part, those actions coming from, um, from elected officials mm -hmm. for whom um, their electorate is in support right. of. Uh, so in other right. words, local DA is not going to touch isn't it. Isn't it. Interesting, Gene, that, <laughs> it's that, be down that, isn't interesting that that mm -hmm. gene, that that bill yeah. specifically talks about going after local government uh, local government bodies yeah. when it deals with abortion. Right. But doesn't say just passing laws that are contrary to what needs to be done. It does right? remind me. And I want to say it's Kansas, but if, if, if it's not Kansas, I apologize to any Kansans <laughs> watching right now. Kansonians. Um, several years ago, during the you know the battle over the Affordable Care Act, um, there was a state that put in place a constitutional amendment granting its citizens the right to bodily autonomy and making their own medical decisions. And that constitutional amendment is now being used in the abortion battle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the state was like, you can't force me to buy ACA, and now... They're using it to they're, say you can't stop me from... Yeah, yeah no. totally, totally. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Glad you got that in. Good stuff there. Thanks again to our Line Opinion panel. We'll be right back here to talk about a report showing our state corrections department, get this, lost track of nearly two dozen people who had been sentenced to life without parole as children. That's in about 10 minutes. But first, an update on a proposed alcohol tax increase rolled into an omnibus tax bill. We're recording this on Thursday, one day after the state Senate approved an amendment to that tax package, increasing the proposed alcohol tax from about a penny per drink to a whopping five cents per drink. That nickel per drink is still a far cry from the original proposal you know of, which was 25 cents per drink which was ultimately tabled in House Bill uh, 230. It's been a roller coaster few weeks for this issue. <laughs> and independent journalist Ted Alcorn has been following all of it closely. I spoke to Ted after the House passed their version of the tax package for some context on why meaningful increases seem to be falling short this year as last year. We'll see what happens. Here's Ted. We want to circle back with our guy Ted Alcorn. Ted sat down with us back in mid-February with some other experts in the field of dealing with the results of alcohol, frankly. <laughs> and he wrote a seven-part series that I very much want you folks to go over, even though we're still in the middle of this fight. It's important. Ted, welcome back to New Mexico in Focus. I really appreciate your time today. Always happy to be here. Absolutely. Now, I mentioned HB 230. It was, at, it was tabled in committee. What happened there? You've been streaming from where you are. Were you first, were you surprised? And second, what were the, what was some of the arguments you heard that made it go down and, and be tabled in that one committee? Well, as you remember, in 2017, advocates brought a very similar bill seeking a quarter uh, drink tax increase. And the measure is meant to impact New Mexico's alcohol crisis in two different ways. It's supposed to raise revenue, obviously, that could be spent on alcohol treatment and prevention, but it's also supposed to marginally increase the price of alcohol uh, to discourage people from, from drinking excessively. And there's a lot of research around the country where states have shown this to, to have that impact. In 2017, the advocates couldn't get the bill through its first committee, um, despite a year-long effort to do so. This year was really different. They came in, um, there's a number of bills related to alcohol that have been introduced, and the tax bill that you're referring to was the most ambitious, again, seeking a, a similar flat 25 cents a drink um, tax. And it, it made it out of its health committee. Uh, and then the tax committees in both the Senate and the House tabled it. Now, they table those bills as a matter of course so that they can consider all the bills that have a fiscal impact and put them into their omnibus tax bill at the end. And, and in this case, that's what's occurred 
sort of. Uh, the bill that ended up, or the, the language that ended up showing up, at least on the House side in the omnibus tax bill, um, includes an alcohol harms alleviation fund. It includes an increase in alcohol tax, but it's a great deal smaller than the sponsors had originally sought. Instead of achieving that 25 cent alcohol uh, per drink flat tax, this is talk, This is looking at about a one penny to two penny increase. So um, the sponsors have been telling me that they're hopeful that the Senate version will establish a stronger increase. They're talking now about a compromise of maybe a 15 cent uh, increase in, in the alcohol tax on the on the Senate side, but it really remains to be seen. And there's a long way to go for both of these bills before they're uh, reconciled and turned into law. The liquor lobby has come out in force as was not unexpected, certainly. But I'm, I'm curious where you sit, what you gleaned from watching some of the opposition and hearing some of the quotes from folks in the, in the liquor lobby about what this excise tax would potentially do to bars, restaurants, a lot of stuff going, floating around out there, that's for sure. Yeah, well, the bill, the original language of the bill was going to apply this flat tax rate to all producers. And for for years, we've given preferential tax treatment to microbrewers, small wine growers, local distillers. Um, and this, the original language of the bill would have eliminated that distinction. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you definitely see a lot of the local and well-known and popular breweries um, and the New Mexico Brewers Guild Distillers Guild coming out in opposition. But the real big guns here are the, the national or even global companies that sell alcohol in New Mexico. And we know nationwide uh, that the alcohol business is really concentrated. The businesses that make the most money on this are Anheuser-Busch, InBev, which is, you know, sells $50 billion in alcohol around the world. Um, and they have been amongst the most vocal opponents, and they're uh, they're there at the hearings, and they made arguments that would you know be familiar to anybody who watched this bill go down in flames in 2017. That it would hurt small businesses. Um, they've also argued that a, a consumption tax like this is regressive, mm -hmm. and therefore it could harm poorer people. Um, one of the one of the members of the Senate Tax Committee uh, said that she was happy to see business going after a bill for, uh, for being a regressive tax, and she really hoped that industry would be there in the future to also support other kinds of progressive taxation, I think, in a kind of tongue-in-cheek remark. Mm -hmm. um, but no, in, indeed, there's been, these hearings have been full of the voices of both supporters and opponents. Um, Mike, uh, my colleagues at New Mexico in depth have done some great reporting to show, though, that one of the forces behind the scenes here isn't just the comments that are being made, but the people who are making it, because the alcohol industry is hired among the top lobbyists in Santa Fe for uh, to, to represent their interests there. And we uh, we did the math on the political contributions and the alcohol industry has given about three quarters of a million dollars to New Mexican legislatures in the last 10 years. That's a figure that the public health advocates supporting this policy measure cannot match. It comes down to what the general public sometimes feels as well. I don't think I've seen any polling out there or anything. Have you had, a, is there anything out there that you've seen that take a temperature of where the public is in New Mexico on this issue? I haven't seen any polling recently. In 2017, the advocates supporting an alcohol tax increase did their own polling, which they released, showing that there was support for an increase on this, particularly when people knew that the, the measure was going to be raising revenue to support alcohol treatment and prevention efforts. And, it, and indeed, this bill would not only increase revenues that would be used for treatment services, but um, now the language is looking like we'll direct more of the existing tax revenues that we already collect to those kinds of services. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, legislators don't, they definitely don't govern by the polls. And I'm, I'm not sure what information that they're getting or feeling from their constituents. I'll say in my reporting, it is remarkable uh, the number of people that you end up speaking with about alcohol issues who, who, who it has had a deep impact on them personally and profoundly. Um, but I think people are a little bit skeptical as well about whether an alcohol tax alone can take care of the state's alcohol problems, which are deep-seated and generational. That's a very fair point you just made at the end there. And there's been a lot of quotes from Legislators who were opposed to this saying the typical, you know, people are going to drink anyway, no matter what it costs, you know, all that kind of a thing. But the fact remains, Ted, in your reporting and your local partners here as well, one in 11 deaths in New Mexico 2021 were alcohol related. And there's a feeling out there that might even be a low percentage when you really sort of parse out, you know, what happens with alcohol in a home. 
Is it that we don't understand how bad the problem is here in, in some regards? I, I wonder if there's an education that needs to happen with some of our part-time legislators about just how bad this problem is for us. The stats don't lie and they are indeed shocking. I mean, uh, I think part of why we don't always observe the harms of alcohol with our own eyes is because yeah. it's a stigmatized uh, condition, alcohol dependence. And when people are really uh, harmed by it and they're really you know, physically uh, injured or falling apart, they're in the emergency rooms, they're in the intensive care units, uh, out of sight, out of mind in a certain way. But alcohol killed more than 2000 people in the state. The last year data we have, the rate of alcohol related deaths in the state is three times the national average. And if you're concerned about fentanyl, opioids, methamphetamine, cocaine, as we should be, these are another big part of the dependence problem in New Mexico. Alcohol killed more than all of those substances did combined. Um, so, so, you know, this is a this is a huge challenge, and uh, those moments were did get aired in the hearings. I will say, um, a doctor from the Indian Health, uh, the Gallup Indian Medical Center, talked about watching her thirty year old patients die with fulminant liver failure, and um, the representative of the bill, Joan Ferrari, shared that her niece had died a month before in an alcohol related fall, um, yielding, uh, you know, messages of condolence from across the room. So I think um, legislators too know and are affected by this issue. And, uh, you know, I think it rightly, they're making it a big part of the discussion up in Santa Fe this year. Thanks again to Ted Alcorn for the interview. To watch our entire conversation, head to our YouTube page or listen to it on the New Mexico in Focus, the podcast, available anywhere you find your podcast. Now, let's return one last time to our line of opinion panelists. A crime bill approaching its final leg at the Roundhouse is providing hope for statewide inmates who are charged with life sentences as children. Senate Bill 64, which would end life without parole as sentencing options for children, is on its way to the governor's desk. The bill would also provide eligibility for parole after someone serves 15 years in prison for a crime they committed when they were under the age of 18. We'll talk about that too. We've seen similar action in other states. Now, Sophie, is it time for us to make the change here in New Mexico, even though I know we've got a lot of demagoguery going on about there about who should rot in prison basically and who shouldn't, you know, yeah. all that kind of thing. And to try to punch through the rhetoric is awfully difficult. Is this, I'm, is this I'm the way? I'm disappointed that we did not lead the way in this one. Okay. I really am. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, the science really does tell us that children's brains don't really reach a mature state until 25, 26. Right. Um, and this, you know, this cuts obviously juvenile offenses at, at 18. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the idea of sentencing a kid, a kid to life in prison, I think shocks the conscience. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful to uh, the ACLU here in New Mexico and the champions within the legislature, um, and also to the national organizations like the Equal Justice Initiative for really putting this front and center across the country and in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. it's, it's shocking, and also shocking is that um, our, our government, you know, our, our prison system doesn't know who all of these kids are. Well. Issue that there, is we? stunning to me. Now I realize mm -hmm. that that sort of the storage and collection of data has changed an awful lot <laughs> in the last however many years, mm -hmm. um, and that we may not have invested in upgrading that. And sometimes when you put a system together, you don't know you're ever going to need mm -hmm. this data. Mm -hmm. But um, knowing that this bill was coming, it is kind of shocking to me that the you know, there was this kind of like, oh, we haven't figured it out. Right. Rebecca, I interesting. I, I mentioned there's going to be pushback on these things similarly. There was a bill introduced uh, last year mm -hmm. that was similar. We might forget about, but Source New Mexico reports the bill was criticized by local prosecutors and some victims of violent crimes who raised concerns. The people who harmed them will be prematurely released. That would seem to be a legitimate concern if you've gone through the trauma of losing a loved one to you know, murder, but that's not what's going on here. And I say again, it's awfully hard to punch through the rhetoric on something like this. Do, do we have a chance here to get some clarity? You know, I, I mm -hmm. really hope so. And, yeah. I, and I, I, I have to acknowledge, you know, like my opinion formed on this, I, I'm, I have not lost a loved one mm -hmm. to a terrible, heinous crime. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really hard to, um, you know, I, I can't speak from personal experience, sure. but what I can do is I can absolutely agree with, you know, Sophie's point that um, so many times, like we see some heinous 
crimes being committed in New Mexico by uh, by kids who are under the age right. of 18, right. um, and mm. uh, and like just to just to put them away, write them off. Mm -hmm. Like it feels like that that they really should be given um, the opportunity to have a second chance, and not even not just a second chance. Like automatically, once you've served your 15 to 25 years, then you're out again. No, 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 no. We're mm -hmm. just talking about can we go back and look at the evidence again mm -hmm. after um, after one of them or after they've been sentenced to life, mm -hmm. and and reevaluating using you know taking all factors into consideration. Kids in New Mexico have it so hard. Mm -hmm. And so to to make a judgment, you know, again, 15 to 25 years ago or longer, you know, to make a judgment and not be able to take all of those factors into consideration mm -hmm. when when sentencing a kid, it it feels like it's a big part that we're missing. You know, childhood right. trauma is right. so important. That's and right. so I I, Rebecca, I got a question. Can can children change? If you've committed double murder as a 17 year old, do you see what I mean here? Can you change? Can that type of person be different in 10 years, 15 years? You know, and I'm, I'm not an expert. I yeah. know that children can change. Okay. Uh, uh, but I, I think that, again, this is not an automatic, if right. you were sentenced to right. life, then we're gonna come back and then we're gonna let you out. Right. It's, it's, we'll come back and let's review again right. and, uh, and decide if maybe we should um, uh, change the sentence or right. adju adjust the sentence based on other factors. Interestingly, Dan, when you think about sentencing and, and juveniles, there's this overall feeling of harshness, some might you know, conclude, that these sentences are really, really stiff when it comes to kids. And we've had murderers get much l less uh, you know, sentences as 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, that kind of thing. W what is this hammering of kids thing? Where does it come from? Why yeah, do we... I, don't, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know how mm -hmm. much of that I, I buy, Gene, that okay. we've got 13-year-olds getting sentenced to grossly harsher sentences than 40 year olds. What I do think is that, you know, mm -hmm. kids can change. Okay. I'm a father of four. Yep. I can tell you some for the good, some for the better. Kids mm -hmm. change all the time. Mm -hmm. Who can't change is the victim. Yep. And so, you know, some of the things that has to be looked at, listen, our, this, our, our entire judicial system is, is flawed. There's no doubt about it. Right. The whole lock them up, throw away the key. You know, we did, I mean, in New Mexico, not to start a whole new conversation, we did away with the death penalty in a state that we killed three people in the last 75 years. All three were, no doubt, they admit it, guilty. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at some point, there is the idea that, you know, we've got to figure out, we talk about kids changing. I do think kids can change, mm -hmm. and, and Sophie knows better than I do, but I don't know how much a 14-year-old changes over 15 years when he locks, when he's locked up with hardcore criminals. That's I mean, the other su part. He's suddenly exactly. about twice the life, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're talking about 14 and then maybe going to 29. Right. Um, we, you know, I think, there, as you said, to open another of another conversation, um, what obligation do we have to those children to ensure that there are opportunities when they come out in terms of education, That's personal right. growth, et cetera? Right. And not just there those children, are adults, programs, right? I mean, we, totally. we, sent, we sentenced men, we sentenced men, women to prison, and they get out in eight years, and you're like, well, now you, you know, you, how do you totally, get a job? How do you get a, a house? Shift, how do you That's a shift in our. Um, our priorities and our perception of what is and isn't appro isn't is and isn't appropriate mm -hmm. within um, within our jails within our prisons and and there's still quite a bit of tension there. I don't want our money spent. This isn't me. Not people not wanting our money spent on ensuring that when folks come out of prison, they're educated, they've um, they've had access to counseling. They, right. You know, they've had the opportunity to improve themselves. That's right. Fifteen years when you figure. You know, that's the doubling of this kid's life. Yep. It yeah, took only I, 14 years to I th get I them think there. At some, I think at some point we have to look at, as a society, we have to start being better at trying to put a process in place that says, okay, this person is trying to change. Mm -hmm. How do we give them the ability to change? These people are not changing, mm -hmm. right? We can't have this whole mm -hmm. swath. I think a lot of the stuff you're that's seeing, though, point, and to end it here, Gene, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll in my comments, is this is why I've always been opposed to mandatory sentencing. There's no reasons for mandatory sentencing. We have judges. Judges are mo lots of times are elected. If they're not elected, they're appointed. I mean, very few judges are appointed for life. Um, they right. they can be held accountable. They yeah. they have. I think judges should be given a swath of ability to look at a case individually because I think it's interesting how in many cases we say everything is individual until it comes to crime and then we're going to put everybody in mm -hmm. this box mm -hmm. when there's reasons behind things and That's judges right. should should That's have right. more discretion which would lead to less of these problems. Interesting point I came across, uh, Sophie I'm curious if you read this, We've the Sarah Lawrence situation with that awful man who 
uh, recruited all those young kids. Oh gosh, that, yeah. Have you read yeah, about this? I did read about it. Well, there was an excellent article uh, because the judge had said that the co-conspirator, the, 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 the young woman, Sarah Lawrence student who helped the older man, she had choices. And the article went on to say, you know what, I've been following cults for a long time. Sometimes these people don't have choices the mm -hmm. way we think they do. Mm -hmm. When you're very young and under the influence, you made sort of make choices, this point earlier. I mean, I, I'll, That's I'll, right. I'll sort of extend Please. it to what we're talking mm -hmm. about. When you're talking about uh, young people, mm -hmm. when you're talking about children, we don't allow them to have many choices. Right. You must That's go to school right. up to a certain age. Yes. Your parents have authority over you, and if you want to sever that authority, the courts have to do that with you. You know, there's, right. there's all of these sort of um, limits Mm -hmm. on the choices of children. And then here is the place where we say, oh, well, you, you had a choice. Right. And you know, one of the things, just to pick up a little bit on what Dan was saying, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that it seems to me this, this bill would do, this change would, would make, would be to give the possibility, to open the door to the possibility that this kid, now an adult, mm -hmm. is making different choices, mm -hmm. has grown, has a mature, a mature brain, a mature right. perspective, et cetera, yeah. instead of just saying, well, we closed that door 15 years ago, right. we're not going right. to take another look. We didn't have time to get to it, but the nonprofit publication ProPublica published an investigative report, guys, that found the state's corrections department has lost track of nearly two dozen prisoners. Did you go through this in committee oh, yeah. and things? Oh, yeah, it's Lord. not the first time. We had the case in Las Cruces with the yeah. guy that got the DWI. I, I don't know how you can lose a juvenile, right. even though they've been sentenced to life. I mean, it, you would think at some point, at least, look, I, I've never been to prison for that long. I've been to jail. We don't, no need to write the letters. We all know. <laughs> well, look it up online. Yeah, look it up online. You can Google it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, at least all the movies I see, people always yelling they're innocent. So you think at some point, some somebody would be like, "Hey, dude, I'm still here. That's right. You know, I'm. That's right. I came in at That's night. Right. I came in at 16, and I'm now 52. <laughs> well, what what are, are we doing? I'm laughing, the but the Guardian it's not funny actually at all. did sort of put out a call for this. Like, That's right. are are you aware of someone who fits this That's right. description? Please let us know. That's right. Um, so they are they are looking for that, and I suspect they'll be got to wrap up there. Sorry yeah. about that. Thanks again to our line panel as always for this week. Ah, be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics or opinions the line covered on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. And catch any episode you might have missed on the PBS Video app or on your Roku or Smart TV. 60 days passes quickly, no? Here we are approaching the end of another legislative session, and what do we have to show for it? The budget is massively bigger, as you just heard, and there's certainly movement on a number of key issues. But there's also something else that seems clear here. The more money we are having to deal with, the more our 60 or 30 day sessions are not up to managing it. You heard the panel discuss how the budget bill suddenly headed back to the Senate for those last minute ads without debate. Is this an acceptable way to legislate? Here's what got exposed this session. When the amount of money to be let out crosses a generational threshold like we're enjoying now, it takes the soberest of minds to manage, but more importantly, time well spent with discussion, debate, in dialogue. We just don't have the luxury of time in our system and the results speak for themselves. With millions earmarked for programs already swimming in cash, as you heard earlier, and lots more who never even got a fair shot to be heard. There'll be lots of crowing about how much did get done, but my concern is what didn't. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week for a final look at the legislature in focus. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.